Again, we have to, uh, I want to thank you all for attending our meeting this morning. This is the meeting of the uh, North Korea Development House of Toy Board of Commissioners, and I'm going to call us uh, to uh, call us to uh, attention and assembly here and open our meeting. Uh, I can get an agenda and open my uh, Okay, so uh, first thing up is the approval of last meeting minutes, um, the meeting of March 14th, 2024, and uh, let us uh, call the roll for approval or disapproval of the minutes of last minute meeting. I approval. I second approval. Move and second. March 14th. Thank you, thank you sir. Mr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Conyers? Aye. Mr. Fraley? Aye. Mr. Casagrande? Aye. Ms. Currier? Aye. Mr. Albert? Aye. Next item up is uh, public comments, in which case uh, we're going to check to see if we have any public comments this morning. Any public comments this morning? At this time, we have no public comments online. Neither do we have anything in the chat, but I'll check the hallway just All now. right. And we, as, as always, we'll remember that our public comments are restricted or limited to uh, three minutes. We're going to be disciplined uh, keepers of the time and, uh, and uh, hold them to that uh, allotted time so that we don't uh, get overboard and uh, managing our business here. So uh, let's be cognizant of that. We have uh, a couple of commissions out this morning. Uh, I assume uh, Ms. Shazinski will be in. She didn't call me and uh, I hadn't heard from her. So I'm assuming she'll be in. I know Dr. Smith uh, will not be in, uh, but he did inform me that he would be out of town with his wife, at which time uh, she was interested in seeing if we, uh, if he could uh, make dial in, and uh, there's no anticipation effort for him, but I think it's uh, honorable that he wants to at least hear what we're doing. So uh, we're gonna get him dialed in so he can hear us, even though there won't be uh, any need, cause, or time for action or specific uh, <laughs> comment. At this time, we have no in-person comments or Thank you very much. Uh, we have a resolution now that will be presented by our executive director, Mr. Nathan Sims. I think he's going to be presenting a resolution. Or maybe not. <laughs> he is just as good topic. In the meantime, uh, while we're here uh, talking, uh, I wanted to uh, say how much I appreciate uh, contribution and commitment of uh, the commissioners on this board. Whenever I've had the occasion to uh, ask one of you to join me with something, effort, some effort outside, you were jumping to the uh, task, and I really appreciate it. All right, Nathan, you're up. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. All right, so uh, today I have, uh, I want to say a distinct pleasure, but I, which it is, <laughs> but it's uh, obviously with a degree of, uh, uh, of sadness, uh, a resolution of gratitude um, for our own uh, Rose Marie Arrington for her services rendered as a commissioner of the Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority. <clears throat> Uh, Rosemary Arrington has served as a member of the Board of Commissioners of the Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority uh, since Jan uh, July, excuse me, 24th of 2012. Throughout her tenure on the board, Ms. Arrington has demonstrated unwavering support uh, for the, the authority's mission of providing decent, safe, affordable housing, as well as related essential services for the citizens of Norfolk. Whereas Ms. Arrington has served 
as a passionate advocate, which is true, <laughs> uh, for the residents of NRHA's public housing communities, as well as our housing choice voucher communities as well, voucher holders, uh, has been a tireless voice uh, for equitable treatment of all residents, regardless of race, age, gender, or economic circumstances. Whereas Ms. Arrington has been a strong supporter of resident services and initiatives, particularly educational and recreational activities for children residing in NRHA's communities, workforce development, and training for low-income residents, and programs for senior citizens, both through her service on the board and through her work as the president of Digstown Tenant Management Corporation. Whereas Ms. Arrington's personal experience as a resident of public housing, and more recently a voucher holder, her lifelong work as a community advocate and her unwavering commitment to justice have provided tremendous insight into the concerns of residents and challenges facing the authority. Whereas Ms. Arrington brought valuable understanding, wisdom, and awareness to the board, and she is and she was instrumental and continues to be <laughs> instrumental in assisting the board uh, to better recognize the impact of NRHA's initiatives on the needs of NRHA's uh, residents. And whereas Ms. Arrington has consistently carried out her responsibility as a commissioner with dedication, perseverance, and compassion. Whereas Ms. Arrington has consistently carried out her responsibility, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> now therefore, be it resolved uh, that we, or you, <laughs> uh, the commissioners of the authority, do hereby take this opportunity to express your sincere and our sincere gratitude as NRHA staff for Ms. Arrington's service to the authority and her many contributions to the board and the residents of Norfolk for the, for the, over the years. But it be further resolved that the chairman of the board of the authority is hereby, I'm not gonna direct you because you're my boss, but I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna encourage uh, that uh, directors provide a copy of the resolution to Ms. Arrington, which we will provide you with one, and a copy of said resolution to be placed on record in the office of the authority uh, on this day adopted on the 11th day of April, 2024. All right. Thank you very much. You have been outstanding advocating when you felt the need to, uh, standing with the team when you knew it was the right thing to do, standing in face of comment and opposition, uh, presenting uh, when times of challenge came without concern or interest for your own self or safety. You've been an outstanding commissioner, and uh, I personally am very, very, uh, not just supportive, but pleased with
<laughs> my adopted brother. Uh, oh, wow. That is so sweet. Oh, uh, thank you, dear. All right. Thank you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my Okay, so uh, he's already ahead of me. <laughs> so Scott Pond, present our budget. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like, with your permission, to switch the order up so that we can get Mr. Jump um, in first to do the audit presentation, uh, and then we'll jump back to the budget. So we'll look back, and then we'll look ahead. Um, the, the audit uh, presentation that he will present uh, has been laid in front of you. Uh, he has provided the PowerPoint. Those of you who have been with us for a few years are familiar with this presentation. Um, and he will, he will present that, and then I'll go into a couple of things about the audit report just so that you know. Uh, the committee, we did talk about the audit at length uh, at, in the committee meeting. Mr. Jump also presented, although we had a bit of a team's issue there and we could hear him but him not us so we did uh, but, we, but we did hear his presentation and uh, any questions the committee had then we talked about after that meeting and, and got those questions questions answered so um, without any further delay I'll introduce Don Jump who is the managing partner of Jump Perry and Company um, Don's firm is out of uh, Tom's River New Jersey they have a specialized practices uh, specialized practice where they audit school boards and housing authorities so, uh, you know, we are in uh, his functional area, and, and they have a great deal of expertise with housing programs. So, Don, if you want to do your presentation. Thank you, Scott. Good, good morning, everyone. I uh, assume everybody can hear me. The, uh, the presentation on the screen, and I believe you all uh, have a copy in your, in your package. So, what I want to do this morning is just a summary of the reporting package for, for June 30th. 2023. It's, it's 146 pages, so I just want to try to make it simpler and go through the package in a, in a summary form. So we can go to page two, the table of contents for what I'm going to do today is just discuss the auditor's reports, which is the most important thing to me, obviously, an overview of the entire package, uh, who's responsible for what in an audit, some financial statement audit risk in, in our focus, financial disclosures, uh, what, it, what the governmental audit reports mean, including the one on uniform guidance. Uh, we did have one finding, which I'll get into later, and then some uh, wrap it up with some additional required communication and a look at the future in terms of uh, GASB uh, statements coming down the road. So if you go to page three, again, as I said, the most important thing to me are the auditor's reports. And there's, there's really five reports in here. The, the first three are the most important. Uh, there's two audits actually going on when we come in. We first audit the financial statements, and that's what the first report's going to be about. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. And then we also do, because you're, you're a governmental entity, uh, we, we do uh, a governmental audit in terms of looking at uh, controls over financial statements and also compliance with uh, general laws and regulations. And then lastly, because you receive federal funding, we do a uniform guidance report on the federal awards. And that, that requires us testing compliance with programs as well as internal control over those compliance. And then the last two are just reporting on something called the FDS, which is the financial data schedule that we have to submit the HUD that then agrees that to the actual financial statements and then just an agreed upon procedures report. So if we, if we can move on to page four, uh, that 146-page package, which I talked about, uh, the overview of that is the auditor's reports uh, on the financials, which we mentioned. Probably the most germane thing to the board is management discussion and analysis, because that's a year-over-year -year comparison of uh, the authority's statement of financial position, as well as the changes in the statement of financial position prepared by management with explanations. So, if there's one area you might want to focus on, it would be that. Uh, 
Then we have the financial statements themselves and including all of the footnotes and then the required reporting, as, as I mentioned earlier, for uniform guidance and, and generally accepted governmental uh, uh, accounting standards. And then lastly, supplemental information, which is mostly that financial data schedule that, that I mentioned. So if you, if you go to page five, so who's responsible for what in an audit? And this is the financial statement audit part, but it also relates to the, to the other reports as well. So management has certain responsibilities. Management is, responsibility, is responsible for actually preparing the financials and including the disclosures that are, that are in the footnotes. Management is responsible for designing controls to maintain that these financials are really free of material misstatement, whether by error or by fraud. And then also management has to provide access to us, the auditors, to look at anything we want to look at, has, management has to comply with laws and regs. And at the end of the audit, management provides us with written representations as to, as to all of the above. If you go to the next slide, six, uh, management and the board also share some responsibility. Both management and the board are responsible to develop a culture of honesty and ethical standards, uh, make sure that authority is uh, operations comply with laws and regulations, and that the financial reporting complies with laws and regulations. And then a board, of course, has oversight for all of this. Oversight for the reporting process, oversight for internal control, and oversight of management regarding the actual federal programs and controls uh, within those programs. So then if you go to seven, we finally get to what my responsibilities are. So I have to express an opinion, in this case, in the first report, on the financial statements that they, in fact, conform with generally accepted uh, uh, accounting principles and, and the fairness of the supplementary information, and, and they do. So that's a positive opinion. I also opine on internal control over financial reporting and compliance with provision of laws, regs, et cetera, and internal control over compliance and actual compliance for the major programs. In order to do that, I have to look at things. I have to perform procedures, which is obtaining evidence to support the financial statement amounts, the disclosures uh, in accordance with uh, generally accepted auditing standards, as well as governmental auditing standards. Then I also have to test compliance with laws, regulations, and agreements. And lastly, test compliance with the major programs, including internal control over those compliance amounts. And then lastly, my responsibility is to communicate these things to the board, and which, which I'm doing now. And if you go to the next slide, uh, so when we look at the financial statements, we try to focus on audit risk and, and audit focus areas. So there's always a risk of management override. We have uh, numerous procedures to, to test for that. And then overall, on a, on a numbers basis, there, there's a risk of over or understatement of financial statement items with significant estimates. Our audit focus areas this year was in the HUD grants, which is obviously the vast majority of your revenue. Leases receivable, which was introduced last year, was a change in, in, in accounting that was uh, implemented in June of 22, actually. And then uh, notes receivable, and then pension and other post-employment benefit liabilities. These were our audit focus areas. If you go to slide if you if you're looking at your financial statement disclosures there's many pages of disclosures these are some of the key areas you might want to look at if you're looking at footnotes the first footnote is, is accounting policies and that just describes to you all of the different policies that the uh, authority follows in note 1a through note 1y and also details component units uh, both blended and discrete component units within the authority Note 1Y also briefly describes a change in accounting principles, although it had no impact this year. And that was just some uh, a new GASB on subscription-based information technology. Uh, then notes receivable, note three, pension and uh, other post-employment benefit liabilities, which are pretty extensive footnotes. And then uh, lastly, uh, of importance, uh, least receivable footnote, which is quite detailed as well. So then if we go to page 10, uh, just quickly that second report we talked about, uh, internal control uh, over financial reporting, we look for 
deficiencies, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies. I'm happy to say there were none noted. Then we go to the third report. Now, the third report is referred to as the Uniform Guidance Report, and that's where we select a major program uh, and we change it every year. So uh, this past year, the major programs that we looked at were housing choice voucher programs. They constituted about 44.4 million of revenue that you received from HUD, whereas all the major programs constituted 76.2 million. So when we look at this, we, we go into compliance, we look at, th these are compliance uh, requirements that HUD determines, not us. So it's just activities allowed, allowable costs, eligibility, reporting and special tests. And then we also test the internal control over those compliance areas. So there were no material weaknesses in control, internal control over compliance. But we did have a finding related to eligibility and that resulted in a, a significant deficiency in internal control over compliance. I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. So if you go to slide 14, uh, again, we, we, we selected housing choice vouchers. We do it on a sampling basis. We one out of 40, and this may sound insignificant, but you have to remember it's a, it's a sample. So it's a, it's a test basis and it's a required finding. One out of 40 was calculated incorrectly. What does that mean? It just means that the, in, you know, the subsidy is based on a person's income. So first of all, you have to- Don, determine can I interrupt you, sir? Yes, I want sir. to interrupt you for a moment. Uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, yeah, I just want to uh, say to you, uh, and uh, doing this at the risk of being scourged by my uh, fellow commissioners here, but what I'd like to ask you to do is uh, kind of uh, give us, if you will, a summary of uh, what we're looking at, or at least what, what uh, the work that you've done. And uh, and then uh, if there's anything that really jumps out at you that we need to be aware of, direct us to that. But your uh, your uh, editorializing some of your comments, I think, may take us to a uh, area of uh, hearing that is a little longer than we want to be. So if you would please uh, endeavor to. You know, take us through, through the numbers, take us through the things that you and your team saw, and anything we need to know further. I don't want to sound disrespectful, but... Uh, no, sir. Sure. I, and, and I understand. I'll speed it up. And I do only have a few slides left. So I, I, I think I just wanted to explain this one, uh, this one finding, and uh, it, it basically... Uh, again, it, our recommendation is that you improve internal control with this area and uh, okay. perhaps form second review of calculations and then management does have a response. And that's, and that's really, that's really the, the only uh, significant matter in here. These other required additional communications, everything, everything here is fine. And then next to the last slide, uh, there was some software issues, which I'm sure Scott has explained. There was some lost data and a shutdown of, of your software for a while. And then lastly, I just want to comment on the central office cost center, which previously had just crazy amount of detail in it. And the authority has taken significant steps to reduce that detail, which reduces errors. And that, that is uh, expected to be completed by the end of this fiscal year. Very, very last slide. Just some future uh, GASB statements uh, coming up. Nothing to be concerned about, quite frankly. And with that, I just want to thank Scott. I want to thank uh, all of the staff for all of their support and, and, and help during the audit process. And not just Scott's department, but all members of the authority, as we, as I said, when we were looking at housing choice vouchers, we had to give it a lot of individuals. So before I enter, entertain any questions, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Hey, Don, how are you? This is Commissioner Connors. Um, kind of in the tune of what um, Chair uh, Alfonso Alvarez stated, like uh, the skinny of this, you're saying that there was only one major opportunity which came up in the eligibility process um, as far as when you audited, right? So eligibility, you said one out of 40 uh, subsidies were uh, 
calculated and correctly, what's the overall percentage um, of error? Um, mm -hmm. What we be talking about um, over the, the the larger number? Well, it's pretty it's pretty hard to extrapolate that. Uh, I mean, just give you an example. You, an example. Yeah. you have maybe fifty five thousand individuals receiving housing choice vouchers. Okay. And again, this is just a, a, a standard auditing practice to sample, uh, you know, based on prior results, a relatively small sample. Typically, if something's going to come up, it does come up. So I, I, I wouldn't say this is, uh, I, it's impossible for me to tell you the total percentage that relates to all those vouchers. It's, it's okay. just that uh, it's easy to make mistakes. You have a lot of uh, a lot of things to do, and what ha what happens is everybody's everybody's income is updated once a year. So in that process, the income goes in, the HAP subsidy is then calculated. And in one of the 40 we looked at, one was incorrect. The other 39 were absolute spot on. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So that that was that's the only thing in your reporting because this it, it seems like one of the major things that you call it out. Other than that, um, just from a layman's term for, for some of us as well, just a clear understanding. There are no major findings that stuck out to you in your audit of our, uh, of our agency outside of what you stated here. Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, other than that, one, one item, everything was really in good shape. Awesome, that's what I need. Thank you, sir. We'll turn it back over to okay. our CFO. I would, <laughs> I would add one thing to that. Um, in, in the, when, when you read the report, you see that it says significant deficiency. That's an audit term that doesn't mean it's a significant amount of money. And, and Don, can, Don can thumbs up, up on that as well. I, I believe it was less than $10. Yeah, it, it, but it was. But it was, but it was an error. Yeah, so. it was $6 a month difference. Yeah. Okay. So we just like to point that out because it's not as though the program, there was a mistake made that was hundreds of thousands of dollars. It, but right. they. HUD defines that as a sufficient deficiency, significant deficiency over control, not over money. So we've, we've been working, Pamela staff has been working very hard on that to, to, try and, to try and rectify that situation. But I just wanted to point that out. It, the word significant can be taken in different ways. So Absolutely. just wanted to point that out. Uh, a couple of things in the report before I move on. Uh, Don pointed out management's discussion and analysis. I believe it starts on page four. That's what you want to read. If, if you want to read the audit report, um, have fun with all those 140 pages, but <laughs> there's there's about 12 pages there that is actually NRHA's <clears throat> presentation of the numbers and the comparative year over year. Uh, HUD requires that any variance over 10% we explain. So that's the that's the piece of that's the only piece of the single audit report now, uh, the way it's the way it's done in 2024 that actually points you to the last year and compares it. So. Uh, that's that's where I would I would point you to read if you want to see about the audit report. And then the last thing I always like to go on the record with this: if you look at the balance sheet, you will see. And I'm not even going to point you to it, but I'm just going to say it just so it's on the record. Suzanne's smiling; she knows what I'm going to say. Uh, you will see a number there that says unrestricted net position, and it's 100 million dollars. That does not mean the agency has 100 million dollars sitting in the bank that is unrestricted and ready to be used. That's an, that's an accounting term. That means that those are our net position or our reserves, which are not tied to fixed assets and are not restricted from the standpoint of a board action or certain programmatic action by HUD. So your reserves in there include your public housing reserves. And as we've talked, they're unrestricted, except they're restricted. You can't use them in Section 8. Section 8 reserves can't be used for public housing, et cetera. And a lot of that net position represents the net of hope six debt that's on the books going back to the Broad Creek properties and, and earlier. So that does not, for anyone listening or for anyone with the board, that does not indicate that, that there's $100 million of unrestricted money sitting around. So I'd just like to put that on the record. And then also, I would like to thank your interim CFO, Kimberly Green, and her staff, specifically Clover Williams, for their assistance in this project. This was the hardest one in my six years here because of what happened with the computers last fall. Um, we basically had to start over again in, in mid-October and it was a lot of work to get this done. So thanks to Don's team and, and my team because we were able to get it into HUD on time. Yes, sir. Um, 
as this Don has uh, overview and yourself having done this uh, audit, what grade would you give yourself and Don uh, after these findings? Well, the finding is programmatic, so it's not it's not financial. So overall, you never want to see a finding, but this is not a this is not to me a finding of commission. This is just it's simply just an error in a calculation, and it has to be pointed out. Now, it, it, it shouldn't happen, but we all make mistakes. And this is just an area where HUD has pointed us to look at these files. So I would, I would defer on a letter grade. I'm, the, the, the word significant makes it sound worse than it probably is. Um, it's not something that's uncommon within housing authorities to, to see these files and, and have these calculation errors. It's just something that we, we try continually to tighten up with everything we do. You want to give yourself a letter grade? No, it sound, it, it would, no, no, I really don't. I, I, would, I would defer to my boss on that and, and, and let him, if, if he wanted to say. I, no, I, you're leaving anyway. So I know. Doesn't matter, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> I mean, plus, no. <laughs> no, you did a good job. Okay. No, I, I, I think I give us all a strong marks this year just for getting it done yeah. um, with, the, with the computer system and, and, the, and the challenges we had last fall. It was it was it was a very difficult process. Yes, Kimberly. It, I mean, it was a very difficult process to just get this done, and uh, and it was a challenge. Um, and that's yeah, where I just I'd like leave it. Add, I, mean, I, just like I think the add, agencies and go ahead, Don. I just wanted to say I, I I think Scott and his team do a terrific job. They, they really do. And I think this year, as Scott said, with some of the difficulties that came up, created some timing issues. But o overall. I think that the entire team does a terrific job. And as you know, there's been a reduction of staff and, 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 I, and I, I just feel like it was, it, was very, it was a job very well done. Yeah, and for the record, the financial position of the agency is a solid A. Oh yes. Solidly an A. We, we have cash in the bank, um, we have some flexibility and you know, the financial position of this agency is extraordinarily healthy. Mr. Perry? John. John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Commissioner Earl Fraley, and uh, early on in the presentation, Scott introduced you as being a, a rich type of uh, uh, audit firm uh, dealing with uh, public housing agencies as well as uh, school boards. Um, uh, in considering agencies of comparable size to us, how do our founding findings match up in your order with the findings in similar size audits? Well, so in, in relation to other agencies and, and this particular finding is, I, even though it says significant deficiency, I, I really feel like it's rather insignificant. Uh, true findings modify opinions. So we didn't have to modify our, pin, our opinion because we didn't have what's called a material weakness, meaning that you know, there, there, there's, there's going to be a lot of errors in this area. So uh, I would say compared to other authorities, this authority does, uh, again, does, does a very good job, always to have done a very good job on the financial side. And on the program side, I think is also, also does an incredible job. You, you know, this is the only type of finding we have found uh, in the years that we've been doing the audit here. This one related stri strictly to housing choice vouchers. And as I mentioned, you have, I, I don't know, I think something like 55,000 vouchers. So it, it, it's likely that there are going to be errors made. But, but compare it, to answer your question, compared to other authorities, this uh, Norfolk does a really good job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Don. You're welcome. Uh, if there are no more questions regarding the audit, any of uh, Steve or uh, our uh, friends uh, that perform the audit. Anybody? Thank you, sir. Mr. You Jump. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work you've done and the way you've highlighted it. Thank you. Thank you. Don, anything else from you? I'm going to take it now, Scott. Don? Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. All right, sir. One more thing, if I can. Okay. Let's Let's look ahead now. Um, Makisha, if you can bring that uh, the budget, budget presentation up.
Yeah, just jump to the first page with numbers if you would. Should be, should be page four. Oh, there you go. So let's now look ahead. Um, one of the things as I pack up, we were tasked with getting this budget done a couple of months early. Um, Nathan, I think, appropriately wanted this done so that we could um, just kind of, they could start implementing this budget, get it into the system, and start moving um, and not um, have some kind of transition on trying to work through it. So Ron Ho, the budget manager, is here. Uh, had a big had a big piece of this, a big part of it as, as we completed it. One of the things that I'll leave here proudest of is that we got the administration to this, of this agency out of using reserves on an annual basis. Uh, this budget again uh, is about two hundred thousand dollars on the good side of using all of the discretionary revenue. I know that as we go forward, uh, Mr. Sims goals is not to use anywhere near the amount of, reserve, of, of earnings that we're using now, but we had to cross that threshold to get it to where we weren't pulling reserves to pay salaries and benefits. Um, through hard work with Michael and, and years past, we, we crossed that bridge last year, and with the changes that we're making internally and with the forecasting that we're doing, we're still in that, in that position for, for 2025. So I'm very, I'm very pleased to announce that. Um, the committee, I want to thank the committee. We've worked hard on this over the past couple of months. Um, the, the way the budget will proceed, we're, we're going to go through this today for a little while. Um, next month, you will have a, a public hearing, which is required. Kimberly will present the public hearing. Um, and then in June, at the regular meeting, not in a special meeting, but at the regular meeting in June, uh, staff will recommend approval of the budget, but it will be the budget as presented today. We don't anticipate making any changes uh, going forward. A budget, as you know, is a spending plan, and it's a plan that's done at a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, things change on a day-to-day -day basis, which can affect it, but the global picture of this budget is going to stay as it is right now. Um, and I'm, So I'm going to go through a, a few things with you basically on this page. Um, I have a cover memo there explaining some things, but I want to go through this page uh, and this page only, and then, you know, obviously be available to take anybody's questions, um, even going forward, you know, through, through Nathan, if that's, if, if that's uh, requested by the commissioners. We have a couple of things that are going to be implemented next year that are adding to the expense lines, one of which, and the biggest of which, and the best of which is a conversion on the computer system. That is, if you look at the first line about the Housing Choice Voucher Program, we very proudly got that in the black last year, and it's, and it's back in the red this time, but that is due to the Yardi implementation and uh, increases in, uh, in, in merit last summer for the, for the pay rates. Um, so that is a one-time thing. HUD presented us with additional administrative fees this fiscal year that we've collected because of the growth in the program which is to be commended uh, from Pamela and her staff. And so that $300,000 is basically money received this year being spent next year. So while it looks like a deficit, if you look at the program over a two-year period, it's still in the black. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. And this is not that program sliding back into needing discretionary income to operate. It will be back, it'll be back on the, on, on the right side of things in fiscal 26. But for fiscal 25, because of the software system and, and, and some other one-time things, um,
at least within the next fiscal year, there should be some return there. Oh, and, and so you know that, I'm sorry, sir, when, when the bond fees are received that we talked about with these bond issuances, they go in there. Okay. They go in there to help with this effort. Yes, sir. Is there a, a, some sort of business plan or at least like an outline and sketch of, of the ROI that you're expecting from it or is it just... It's no, not necessarily. The, the first thing that we have to do, and we worked with a strategic planning consultant yesterday, mm -hmm. was to come up with a development schedule. Okay. And that's what they've been working through with the, with the forum to say what's first, what's next, what's next, what's next. And then I'm sure performers will be set out. But that 10x return is, is, is a, a, a hope, a desire, but it's based on some education. Oh, yeah, together. yeah, because we, yeah, we, have, we, have some, we have some thought about what land sales can generate, with, and we have some thought about what developer fee mm -hmm. from renovation of the mid-rises can generate. Right. So we just have to control the outs. Right. And then, and then be able and to be able to quantify the. End. I think it is. Okay. Yeah, seven to ten years is the realistic timeline. Yeah. Uh, you will see a line there that says HRV. Just to clarify what that is, that is the funds that we have received from HRV, and it covers the cost of um, Mr. Norman's staff where grants fall short, uh, so that we can continue those fine activities irrespective of, of, of grant funding. We're, we're very lucky in this case to have that available source. Um, so if we are approved for a, what's called a family self-sufficiency or a resident opportunity for self-sufficiency, Ross grant, if we receive one of those two, those grant funds will replace some of the HRV money and then the HRV money can be used elsewhere or just held back for the next time that it's needed. But I just wanted to point that out to you what that meant. Um, because I thought I thought it important that we that we highlight what that what that source is. There's some grants that have been submitted already uh, for that shortfall. Has it? Did we talk about a grant? Uh, yeah. It was a Ross grant or FS. Not not for um, not for the current. Um, the only one we put in for thus far has been the um, youth bill grant youth with bill. A, with the Department of Labor, the right. um, FSS uh, grant, and the. Um, the FSS grant and the Ross grant hasn't come up yet. Yeah, they're coming up. Yeah, they'll be coming up soon. And when you you'll know something about the whether or not the uh, youth field grant should be soon. Um, yeah. uh, um, they said spring. So um, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully any moment. And that and that it was in what amount was that the youth field grant? Uh, so one uh, one point five million. One point five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that concludes. Um, again, you'll have a, uh, I'll take any questions and then just to, uh, again, outline, there'll be a public hearing next month. And then um, this budget will come before the board in June for approval. Sounds good. Thank okay. you, Scott. Thank you. For all this you're doing, uh, all this you've done. Thank uh, you. And helping uh, uh, the Development Housing Authority uh, maintain a status as one of the best <laughs> managed authorities in the state. Uh, Mr. Sims, I wanted to ask you before you go, sir. Uh, <laughs> oh, go, go, go. <laughs> uh, is it possible for us to uh, make available maybe an hour or 40 minutes time uh, for uh, one of our finance people uh, to be uh, on the phone, in Zoom, on a Zoom call, right here in the boardroom, uh, to just kind of walk us through some uh, acronyms and uh, you know nicknames that HUD has uh, given us uh, programs. And, so if you don't do this every day, you know it, 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 we do it every day. I, yeah. I, I have to, I have to say, I would add to that. I, I think I don't know who could do this because it would be horrible. So I think we need an acronym dictionary. I mean, I'm really pretty fluent in acronyms, and there are things in here I'm like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and, and so, you know, in so much spare time, maybe they can you know, just start collecting on a compendium of, sure. um, I mean, and as we bring the board members on, yeah. it's easy to their ability to, you know, or is that my ability? Yeah, no, um, yes, yeah, we'd be happy. Um, and it's all way to it. It's how we yeah. respond to uh, some of the things that are presented or done, uh, we have a, a financial chief financial officer that has demonstrated the 
quality of his service and uh, and the and the product he produces and his budget and, and financial. Uh, but but I know that a lot of times people will be uh, kind of overcome with uh, mm -hmm. information. That they don't understand, but they uh, won't say it. They don't want anybody to know they didn't understand something. So I think it would help a long way to sure. kind of broaden our enlightenment. So I now, uh, if you allow me, I'm not embarrassed to say that I don't know stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I had occasion, I was reading some of our materials. I think Scott had provided to us before. Came across an acronym. Right. Uh, and I'm reasonably fluent in acronyms <laughs> myself. Yeah. Uh, this one I didn't know. The acronym was BNO. For my advantage, what, from my perspective, what is that? Big night out? Uh, what, is that? <laughs> what does that mean? But Scott clarified that for me. Uh, well, well, what and and the amazing plan? thing about that is these acronyms can distort That's right. uh, what you're trying to comprehend. That's if you right. understand it's exactly what they mean. What, <laughs> what is BNO? Scott? <laughs> BNO is, uh, is, a, is one of the segments of our general ledger account coding. It's called Broad National Objective. So broad that's national, one that we're using. National objective. Yeah, that was, a, that was a segment of the account number that was used in the past when we were doing a lot of active CDBG work. Mm -hmm. oh, to quote some very Community very development walking away from that. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, appreciate everyone's time this morning. And so, um, as there was a lot of information going through um, through uh, Scott's presentation as well as Mr. Jump. Um, what I wanted to do was kind of start out um, by uh, really kind of giving kind of a little bit of a reflection of where we've been. And so as uh, everyone knows, uh, pretty much in this room, uh, we uh, lost a member of our team a few weeks ago. And so uh, for those uh, who didn't remember uh, Leslie and Hannah, uh, she came. Uh, we, we we politely <laughs> asked her to present uh, the information on occupancy, and uh, she she came in uh, with her uh, very soft voice, but uh, came hard with the facts. Uh, and so, and that's generally how she uh, has operated. And so, um, since that uh, day. Um, there really has been, uh, I mean, this organization really has been different. Uh, and so I say that um, as really kind of a remembrance of her uh, and the work that she has done uh, as, you know, as part of our organization and what she's meant to us uh, as a family. And so um, we're continuing to work through that. I think we're on the other side of the, the initial shock. Um, I think there's still a lot of, a lot of grief, um, but we are, uh, supporting one another, and so uh, I want to thank quite a few people who have done that. Um, uh, Mike Clark being one of them, Karen Rose being another, uh, Sean Dave Bowden being another person uh, as well, uh, Pamela being, being one of them too. Um, just a lot of different people, Joni, a, a lot of different folks in this room, a lot of folks in this organization, Julius, uh, who dispersed um, our brief counselors uh, in a Split notice <laughs> in in the morning, uh, and so it's been it's been difficult. Uh, but we are really as we move through the process. I think there's a ton of memories um, that we have all kind of uh, reflected on, and that's her legacy uh, as part of this organization. And so I want to just take a moment to to recognize that. Um, and I would say as we continue to move through this process, check with one another. <laughs> and, um, and what I've said to the organization, uh, because often in grief we we do this. Um, you know, we, we try to push on. Uh, and so, and we are pushing on and we thank our clients um, that we have served who have been flexible in terms of when we have to reschedule and do things and they understand that the, the staff is going through things. Um, but, uh, you know, we, I've said to our team that it's okay not being okay um, because that is not easy and that is something that we all have to kind of, uh, you know, process in our own, in our own way. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, we're going to continue to support our occupancy group uh, because that's the right, uh, the right thing to to do. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's kind of where we are. So please continue to keep the organization and Leslie's family um, in your prayers. Um, the other part I wanted to talk about uh, was the uh, Scott talked about the the budget, and so um, I'm excited about the budget for 
a number of different reasons uh, because I think it really presents the uh, puts the organization in a really good position. It shows that we're listening. Uh, it shows that we're doing a lot of different things and we're really focused. And so some of the things, highlights uh, of the budget uh, that we are proposing is not only just the development piece and moving that forward, because that is very much important. Um, we have an old housing stock. <laughs> um, there is there's nothing efficient about it. Uh, people <laughs> do not like it, uh, and but, we, but it is affordable housing for the city, and we are trying to make sure that we preserve that where we can. We have other issues that we're trying to incorporate uh, as part of our housing, meaning having more rooftops that support uh, economic activities that include grocery stores and other types of amenities. So we have a we have a balancing act to do. Uh, and so we're, we're obviously focused on that in terms of making sure that uh, the Steve and his department have the resources they need to do what they need to do. I'll let Steve talk about the, the developer forum and all of that. Um, but I think that's a preview in terms of the things that we expect to do going forward. The other part of that is, is the voucher program. And so we've heard <laughs> from, from everybody, we listen to everybody. Uh, we understand that there is a tough, there's a tough road in terms of individuals with vouchers to, to find housing. Uh, this, this budget includes uh, funding for, for search assistance. This budget includes um, uh, additional uh, resources to help with an additional month's deposit, security deposit. It helps us in terms of creating a uh, asset protection program, which is a really a sinking fund uh, for uh, landlords who are interested in joining the program, uh, who may be hesitant on the fence because uh, often when people uh, talk about the voucher program, the first thing they go to and say is, what if they uh, tear up my unit or this, that, and the other. That rarely happens, rarely, <laughs> to be clear. But we're putting a fund aside uh, to, to do that, uh, to create a fund uh, that will go anything beyond normal wear and tear, uh, similar to like an insurance fund, anything beyond normal wear and tear, up to $2,000. So we're working through through the particulars around that. Going to try to make the inspection process <laughs> a lot easier. We're going to do that. We're going to try to recruit a lot more landlords and developers because that part is very much important. So we're focused on these different pieces. Why? Because it matters. We're talking through with client services and making sure they have the resources that they need it and that everybody is interwoven. Because I want everybody to kind of understand that this summer and going forward, we're out in the community. We're doing a lot of community engagement. We have a lot of different things to do. A lot of things fall on our shoulders. They do, <laughs> rightly or wrongly. They, they, they fall on our shoulders. And we're going to continue to work through that through engagement. So whether it's engagement in terms of transformation of our community, because we are going to transform our community. That's clear. Um, what's your status and where you are? How can we help move you forward? That's where we are. The other piece of that is trying to make sure that we are assisting our residents the best way that we can throughout this process. There's a lot of misinformation. <laughs> a lot of misinformation uh, in terms of what the authority is and is not doing. So I think people just need to kind of understand that. Right. Case point, uh, you guys approved us to do a, a bond issuance, and part of it has been that we are going, we are destroying the community. In one thing, the other part of that is that we are we somehow were authorized to acquire the site that we voted on, and we're planning to tear it down. Neither one of those is true, but that's the stuff we got to do. <laughs> but that's okay um, because we're going to keep meeting people halfway. We're going to keep doing what we need to do uh, to make it a lot easier. Um, for folks. So I just wanted people to understand that the budget is filled with priorities, right? It is filled with a lot of priorities, a lot of good things that we really want to do, uh, things people want done. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time, too. This is, I've, I've been very transparent that the organization was built <laughs> in a certain way and in a way that everybody wants to do things to get done. And so we're working through that. So I thank Mike, Scott, April, um, all the managers for being very open and um, to he getting that feedback because the strategy is the strategy. It's the execution that everybody really kind of cares about at the end of the day and the result. So we have to make sure that everything matches up. Lastly, I want to say that, um, you know, some people chose, uh, didn't, didn't like river views and, and chose water features with botanical gardens in their office. 
Uh, and so this is, uh, that'd be Scott Ponds for anybody who didn't know. Um, so yeah, that's his office in Tampa and what it looks like. Um, but I wanted to say that this is Scott's, uh, obviously this is his last week with NRHA as he trans, uh, transfers to the Tampa Housing Authority. And so I wanted to really kind of commend Scott in terms of the opportunity, but I also wanted to say that I appreciate you being a good working partner uh, from the day I started, <laughs> before I started. Uh, you know, it, it's part of this process. And I think you've helped kind of set us up uh, in a way uh, that will help us uh, do great things going forward. <laughs> Kim, <laughs> you're the interim CFO. Been in now for two weeks. We got you back. Um, and we will do what we can to support you through this process. Uh, and we will do what we need to do. Same thing, Ron, at the end of the day, we will do what we need to do. Uh, so we got a lot of work to do. Uh, you guys know that. Uh, but we're going to continue to do that. But um, I just wanted to say those things because it's important. We got to continue to tell our story because people are telling stories about our story. Uh, but we have, but we have a good story to tell. And I want people to understand that we're helping with search assistance, we're helping with mobility counseling, we're <laughs> helping in terms of moving the development forward. Uh, and so, uh, and it takes a lot of investment uh, to be able to do that. And that's not just NRHA's investment. So that's how I'm spending the bulk of my time. <laughs> is making sure that we get investment. Uh, we're working to get a meeting scheduled with um, the senior leadership at Virginia Housing, and so they were very gracious around that. Um, we talked to a number of different uh, lending institutions because they were very much interested in what we're doing. And so I'm going to use my time wisely, uh, and, and I'm going to try to bring home the bacon, <laughs> and I'm going to try to be a chief advocate uh, for all the things uh, that we need uh, within the city of Norfolk to be great. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I was trying to formulate this question in my mind this sure. morning as mm -hmm. I was uh, preparing myself for the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, this comes from a personal space, having worked with the agency sure. for 20 and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, how overall, and maybe you don't have the answer now, mm -hmm. is the employees and staff of NRHA um, how is their work-life balance? Uh, how do uh, the agency employees overall feel about? Because I know you've met with mm -hmm. many of the departments, if yeah. not all of them. Correct. Um, I guess I'm a proponent of um, getting assessments and or uh, information back on you know how we're how we're doing surveys of sorts. Yeah, I think a survey of sorts that may speak to how the employees of NRHA, how they're doing, how they're feeling, mm -hmm. uh, because we're going to be needing their engagement yes. uh, more and more. Yes. And I guess an organization is only as healthy as their employees are. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so I want to get to a point that we do an employee survey. I know April, I mentioned that too, but April got a lot of employees, so I'm already going to answer the question for you, so you don't have to give a look or anything like that. But we do, <laughs> but we, we do have to engage, uh, and we continue to engage. We have our all-staff meeting this afternoon, so and that's part of our continued effort. I think the, um, you know, having to deal with the tragedy, I've never really come into contact with more people who have asked one another how they're doing, right? When it's normal to say, how are you doing, <laughs> right? The, and that's, that's been the conversation. Um, so I think everybody is at a reflection point where they're like, hey, I mean, there's more to it in life <laughs> than, you know, what we're doing. But we're also dedicated to the work that we do because we understand who we serve. So there's always that push-pull. And so we're always trying to figure, figure out things uh, to do and ways to continuously engage. Um, because I think that that's very much important about people taking time. I think maybe something that people didn't quite understand, but probably are understanding, like, we have this two-hour rule. I don't understand the two-hour rule, but we don't have a two-hour rule anymore. But the, <laughs> but the two-hour rule was, it was in place, and that just allowed people a little bit of flexibility, where I said, okay, well, why don't we focus on personal time off, right? I mean, and so we only had one day <laughs> uh, under the authority for personal time off, beyond what your normal vacation days are. We have three days now. We changed that from we get rid of two day, the two-hour rule, but now we have three hours. You have three days uh, to use, and so if there's about that work-life balance. I think the other part of the work-life balance, because people will scream that all day, but I, I've been around it enough to know like your job's harder because your your process is convoluted, 
you made it hard or someone made it hard for you. And so we're trying to get through that process where it's not convoluted. Now, I may say things that scare or may have scared <laughs> half the people in this room <laughs> and probably a lot of people in this organization. But if you keep talking through it and you keep seeing that there's a benefit to how it impacts your, your day to day, more and more people have come to that realization. So, and I don't have a problem really kind of explaining that. Um, I think we will take, we will continuously take the temperature. We do that as part of, um, you know, the, uh, the all staff of people who are not bashful about <laughs> uh, emailing me or uh, sending a message through somebody to get to me and, or talking to other people, frankly, uh, as well. So we just have to create that degree of environment. It's a change culture that we're in the middle of, probably that the agency has not seen uh, in quite some time. <laughs> and so there's a lot of angst. Um, there's natural a lot of discomfort. And even when the people are like, hey, I'm overworked, I agree. Um, staff knows at the end of the day, but my solution isn't always throwing people, more people at it because that's not necessarily the root of the problem. you got to understand the root of the problem. Throw more people at it, you just throw more people at it. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to continuously work through that to, to gauge that temperature. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Um, also, we have implemented um, new hire check-ins. So we do 30, 60, and 90 day check-ins now with all of our new hires. So supervisors meet with them, ask them um, a series of questions. How's it going? How's your training going? Um, do you do you have the resources you need to perform your job? At each mile mark, there's a different set of questions. They delve deeper into that. That allows the supervisor to um, establish a rapport with their employees. And it also allows us to address any issues right then and there versus the employee resigning without us not being notified of what's going on. And all of those um, new hire check-ins um, come to me. I review them personally. And if I see any issue, I get with the supervisor and we have a conversation on how to move forward. Um, until we get to the survey piece, we're doing new hire check-ins. And we're also going to do state interviews. And state interviews are um, similar to the new hire check-ins, but it's with current employees who we randomly pull. You said, who was that? Stay. 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 Mm -hmm. So okay. we, we pull random employees and we ask them, how's it going? How do you like your job? Have you thought about leaving? What would make you leave? Just taking a pulse of the culture and what we need to change in different departments. So my team, we're working through that until we are able to get to the formal survey stage where we um, survey all of the individuals and see what the overall um, areas that need to be addressed are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure, I don't want to deny you of your time, Scott, to do the financial update, but I also want to acknowledge our interim CFO. She wanted to do the, do the report out for the finance piece, too. So. Or you can tag team. I'm, I'm just stepping away, though. <laughs>
Well, call him and he'll he'll tell you what he's doing. <laughs> so, um, Scott, this is our new CFO. Yes, it is. Um, That's he, why she walked the way she walked. She's in charge. She came in this morning and she was large and uh -huh. in charge. She's in charge. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kimberly Green. I've been with the Housing Authority for 15 years, actually. Um, stepping into this position, this interim position, um, I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, Scott has trained me well. Tom here has trained me well. And um, I will just say, as a new person coming in, trying to acclimate myself, I ask for your patience. I ask for guidance and be open to new and different things. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Scott did the financial presentation with the budget and the office. <laughs> he had to complete his task before he left. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're through uh, the uh, executive director comments. We're going to get to the departmental updates and begin with. Well, you left Thompson, yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Thursday. We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I'm going to talk about a survey that we did with our residents. This is as a result of our um, a survey that we did with our, our, our residents' community needs. And this is as a result of um, our public housing committee meeting with uh, Commissioner Lewis and Commissioner Amy. Um, so we decided to do a survey. So we sent the survey out to every occupied unit that we had. And at the time of the survey, we had 2,288 occupied units. Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. We'll fact we'll fact check that. We'll make sure we fact check those numbers on. Uh, okay. right. we, we got you. No, we really had two thousand two hundred and eighty eight <laughs> occupied units that we uh submitted a survey to and we got back five hundred and ninety nine. Uh, completed surveys. We actually got back that, more than uh, 2,288. Yeah, we actually got more than that. We had well over 600, but some of them we, we just couldn't use because for various reasons. So, but 599 um, completed surveys. So that's actually 26%. Um, so, which is which is pretty good. So it, we good. we did it manually, so it took some time to get the number um, that we needed to move forward. So the, I'm going to go over some of the numbers with you today. Um, as far as housing needs, we had 53% of respondents had at least one member of their household with a, with a disability or chronic illness. 13% said their home is not the appropriate size for their family. Educationally and career-wise, we had 31% of respondents wish to further their education or own a business. 15% of respondents are interested in receiving uh, job search support. Supportive services needs. We had 40% of respondents are interested in supportive services needs. Uh, we had 73 respondents specifically note that they were interested in home ownership. So we gave that contact information for those 73 uh, residents to our client services as it relates to home ownership. Uh, we had seven respondents noted interest in uh, domestic abuse support. And we, we gave that contact information to our uh, securities director to reach out to them regarding that. So all of, all of the responses that we got we, we, we're going to forward that contact information to our, our client services department so that they can um, address what the, some of the needs were. So as far as community engagement, 16% uh, of respondents uh, volunteer in their community. 60% uh, 
are aware of the TMC and advisory council, which is a good number, but we discussed with Julius, he, he wants to see that number higher. So. Uh, it's not a bad number though. And then the rest of it, we, we broke out, um, just, to, just to tell you by community what the response was. Our, our greatest uh, percentage as far as response came from Sykes Midrise. They had 72 occupied units at the time of the survey and 60 of the uh, residents responded for, for 83%. So hats off to Sheila Whitaker. She's the manager at Sykes. At Cottage Bridge, we had uh, 45 occupied units at the time and 32 residents responded for 71%. The Hunter Square, we had 89 units occupied, 59 responded, 66%. Bob at Midrise, 82 occupied, 50 responded, 61%. Partrea, uh, 101 occupied, 56 responses, 55%. Franklin Arms, 97 occupied, 37 responded, 38%. Young Terrace, 626 occupied units for a, a 200 resident response uh, at 32%. Although they did have the highest number of responses uh, because they have the, the largest number of units. It's still, the response was still kind of low there, but it was good enough to get a, a feel for what the needs are. So uh, North Wellington, 24 occupied units, four responses, 17%. Oakley, 247 occupied units, uh, 34 responded, 14%. Grady Village, 312 occupied units, 32 responded, 10%. Uh, Digstown, 305 occupied units, 22 responded, and that is 7%. And finally, Calvert Square had 288 occupied units, 13 residents responded for just 5%. So that's the total of the 599 and the 26%. So this gives us, a, um, this was really good. We, we learned some things doing this. Next time we're not gonna do it manually, we're gonna use a QR code because it'll be easier to get the numbers together. So it, it took a long time um, because we did it manually, but we won't do that again. Any questions? Is this something that you undertake uh, on a regular basis? We will going forward. This is the first time since I've been here um, that we did a survey. Um, I, I think it is a good idea to do it periodically because you know the residents change. You know it, it doesn't stay. It's not a constant. So I think we should definitely um, do it regularly. Yes, uh, on our on our committee, and I want to thank Ms. Yvette and her team and staff for all the hard work uh, that they put forward, um, we talked about this uh, on a few of the meetings and uh, she went forth with her staff to implement the survey to bring us back this information. So this gives us kind of a, a baseline uh, data uh, where we can truly begin to move forward to engage more uh, with residents and help and assist them uh, in their needs on and on every imaginable level. And so I had said to the board of commissioners that at some point in time, we would bring this information back mm -hmm. to report to you. So you'll have a general idea as to what is uh, going on uh, with the population uh, that we serve. So Ms. Yvette, thank you so much for those findings. It's my pleasure. Any other questions? <laughs> That's it for me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, Pam. We, no, we have Pam, then followed by uh, Steve and Joyce. Good morning, Pam. Good morning, Commissioners. Hope everyone is doing well. With the Housing Choice Voucher Program, we are excited about the new initiatives that our actual our chairperson, or rather our director, has stated as we continue to ensure that Norfolk residents have decent, safe, affordable housing through the Housing Choice Voucher Program. I just wanted to share with the commissioners and everyone information about the Housing Choice Voucher Program, that it is not just a tenant-based program out of our 
members within the voucher program, we do have 585 red project-based voucher units that are actually within our public housing communities, your Brandy Village, that are inclusive and included whenever we um, give our members for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So those properties are included in everything that is done for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. But I did want you to know for the actual year of 2023, the Housing Choice Voucher Program has been extremely busy throughout the year. We actually completed 3,985 annual re-exams, which is the information that I've did give you in the report 2,850 interim changes with persons having changes in their income, et cetera. So we continue to assist our clients in any measures needed. We are extremely happy that we had 660 new admissions to come on our program. So 660 new persons came on our program and only 85 people that left the program. So that is a big boost with the program. Um, as Scott mentioned before, the more individuals that we put on, we actually bring more administrative fees to the authority, but our main focus is to house more people. We recently took applications to assist um, individuals that will qualify for a mainstream voucher, individuals that homeless, near homelessness, or exiting the institution. And actually at this time, still housing people, we are accepting applications for the Aspire at Church Street project-based voucher community, which is scheduled to start leasing up in the month of May through July. The applications that we are taking now for 45 days is for former Tidewater Garden residents. We continue to have a landlord outreach where we're pulling landlords in. We are really trying to get a marriage with landlords with properties that are in high opportunity areas with low poverty and the incentives hopefully within our next budget year will assist us in doing that which will provide greater opportunities for our housing choice voucher program participants we do have at this time a rolling pbv rsp which opened up on april 5th and it will close on May 3rd where developers may apply for project-based vouchers. We also continue to work with the TBV properties at this time with for the Tidewater Garden residents. We just completed the lease up for Origin, I'm sorry, Reunion, which is a senior property at Kenya. And we are now in the process of leasing up for our former Tidewater Garden residents, Origin Circle. So we continue to just and excited about helping the people have um, affordable housing. We are looking forward to very shortly implementing the INSPIRE inspection, which is a HUD requirement, October 1st, and also um, Norfolk was chosen out of the HUD program to implement the small area FMRs, which we will have to do October 1st as well. HOTMA is coming soon based on when our actual software will be able to complete and allow us to implement that program. Any questions? Okay. You indicated that 80, you, you, you indicated that 85 participants left Yes, and, and right, and that's basically in the participations. Many of them were deaf. I didn't want you to think they just left. Yeah. Many were over income, which is an awesome thing, which allows saying that the families have become self-sufficient. During the uh, St. Paul Advisory Committee meeting, at some point we had also been informed that some people chose not to go back uh, on the program. So when they leave the Tower Garden. Yes. And that's a good thing. And that is a good thing. And that is based on their income. They desire to be self sufficient. So self sufficiency is always a plus. Absolutely. And we have our programs here, like our family self sufficiency program, which assists and guide people in becoming self sufficient. That is actually a goal of the agency. I agree. Sam. Um, I know you said that you guys are uh, taking um, for 
required, you gotta take an uh, uh, application and things of that nature. Uh, when I look at this other wait list that you have, um, I'm just asking from a logistical perspective because uh, I think it's like the page, whatever it is. Uh, I don't know, but one of the pages in here has your wait list. Yeah. So you have some places like Cottage Bridge with 1,100 people on the wait list, Origin with 1,000 people on the wait list. Grandy Village has 1,800 people on the wait list. Like, do those people not automatically just go to different areas where we have new, newer properties and become a priority? Like, why do you have to kind of, there's, it seems like there's a wait list for everything that we're doing. Maybe, I, I know it's a choice, right? I know that's the model of the agency's choice. So is that why you have individual wait lists as, as, as such? So for the Housing Choice Voucher Program, we do have an overall wait list which of course that number is 3,000 people, but with the project-based communities, they're site-based wait lists because of course it's the individual's choice. So they can decide, oh, I would like to live at the Cottage Bridge or I would like to live at the Banks of Berkeley. I'd like to live at Church Street Station. When you're looking at the Church Street Station apartments, they are for homeless people only. So a lot of people apply but once they are drawn from the waiting list, they do have to be able to verify the preference. So we have the Church Street Station, the Crescent Square, the um, Heron's Landing. Those are homeless facilities that are actually managed by Virginia Supportive Housing, where we, and we have offered them project-based vouchers to assist those individuals there. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And I would imagine from what uh, Commissioner Carter just described, a lot of those folks are on the waiting list for several places. Correct. Some people are on every waiting list. <laughs> every waiting list. It's not like one entry. Right? Yeah. Like it isn't right? one entry. Yeah. With the exception of like with the Aspire at Church Street, which is open right now for the 45 days, only former Tide Ward and Goddard residents can apply at this time. After we complete this application for the Tidewater Garden residence on May 16th, we will open it at, the, at that time for the general public as well to apply for Aspire. So there will be two listings that you will see at that time that okay. will say Tidewater Garden residence and then you will see Aspire as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, uh, any other questions for our Excellent uh, manager of our housing choice vouchers program and all the things that come with it. Any other questions or comments, Sam? Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pam actually has uh, given me a great segue um, into a lot of my presentation, also. Pam noted the Aspire, she noted Origin, she noted Reunion. All three of those projects are affiliated with our Choice Neighborhoods program. Um, Pam noted with Aspire with the waitlist open today, uh, or, or waitlist open for Aspire, and that's part of the Choice program where we provide our Tidewater families first preference to get into the CNI project. Um, she noted that um, Reunion, uh, which is a 72 uh, unit senior building, is fully leased up. Um, we still have a, a few more, a handful of moves going into that property, uh, but that will also be fully occupied by the end of the month. Uh, Origin, um, which has 120 units, that's actually, um, it is uh, almost leased up. It's about 80%, um, and we have families moving into that one also quite regularly, and we'll see uh, that one probably fully, fully occupied um, early next month. Um, a big shout out to not just Pam and her staff, that, um, um, the inspectors, as well as um, the, the HEV staff, but this is also a, a huge shout out to Leslie. Um, occupancy staff has been critical in um, getting all of these CNI projects up and running and uh, um, with getting folks in there. And so that was a hard loss, um, but big, big kudos to her staff because they've worked tirelessly um, with all the, the various items and issues that we deal with with lease up with our, our former Tidewater families. We've got a great crew uh, behind the scenes at NRHA that makes sure that we, we address a lot of those things. Um, I do wanna 
um, continue with some uh, updates on CNI before I get to the developers forum, which I know everyone would kind of want to talk about. Um, just wanted to note that um, earlier in the year, um, the city was was uh, getting had a had issued, or late last year, the city had issued um, the RFP or the um, uh, sought bids for the phase two infrastructure, which is kind of critical for the next phases of the uh, development, the housing development. Their bids came back in in, in January or early or early February, and they were incredibly high. Um, so the city had to take a pause on on that project. Um, this week, they did approve the additional funding um, to move that project forward. So we expect them to issue the notice to proceed for the phase two infrastructure in the next two to three weeks. Um, that will has pushed us back a little bit with our housing on the next two phases. Uh, but now we are looking to close with phase three um, in January of next year. And phase four should close in the spring of next year. So a little delayed, but still still working towards um, getting everything done. Um, next, I want to note um, we've got a lot of a lot of things moving forward. As uh, Scott mentioned in the budget, and Nathan mentioned in his presentation, there's a lot of development activity going going on. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight this month is uh, the mid rises, Partray and Sykes. Uh, we have the um, teams out to those communities this this month, uh, the architects as well as our inspection teams. Uh, they will be there on the 15th and the 16th for both of those communities. Um, and then we will be quickly following with resident meetings with our architects and with also with the uh, NRHA staff to go over the RAD conversion um, Section 18 disposition process. Um, the uh, meeting with sites will be on the 17th. The meeting with Partray will be on the 23rd. Um, so we are, are fully engaging now with the residents as well as moving that, those projects forward with the idea of um, ultimately coming back to the board for a RAD Section 18 um, uh, approval um, so that uh, next year we can go for tax credits and begin a renovation uh, project. Again, noting to the board, both of those communities as well as the other two uh, mid-rises with Bobbitt and Hunter Square um, although they have seen some renovation, mostly in Oak, on the uh, common areas over the years, they have not had a full renovation of the, re of the inside of the residential unit in, in probably since they were originally built. Um, so these are, are critical improvements that we need to make in order to keep these, these properties viable. So we had this thing earlier um, called the Developers Forum. Um, I want to first do a big shout out and thanks to everyone that attended. Um, many of the commissioners, y'all were there. And all I can say is we can plan, we can um, set up spaces, um, but in, in all honesty, it's the participants that make the events uh, with, uh, with the energy. So even though that we're still buzzing from the events, um, we are, are very appreciative of the energy that all the participants, uh, the developers, the vendors, the GCs, um, uh, you all, um, staff, city staff, NRHA staff, um, all sorts of folks came in, really made those events. Um, I got to do a big thanks to NRHA staff. Um, LaShawn, uh, Christy, uh, Joni, um, Anita, Radu, uh, Shantae, and Elaine, um, all these folks work uh, quite hard in getting and putting this event together, always there in the background as things were going on. Um, as you can imagine, there were lots of little hiccups and issues throughout this whole time frame, and um, I don't think any of y'all had to witness it or see it because it was just handled uh, very, very nicely. Um, so a great group. Uh, they did a phenomenal job. I, I, I can't, I'm, and then Mr. Nathan was going to say more to, a little bit later today in our meeting, but they did a, a, an incredible job. Um, so the forum, and just for the group, what was it all about? So as we embark and move forward on our needs to radically transform our properties, whether it's the mid-rises, whether it's the, the family communities, the, remain, uh, the large vacant parcels that the authority has, we need partners. Um, and so the idea of the forum was, let's go out. Um, there are a lot of great folks out there that know how to do this business, that are on the like mindset of providing quality, affordable housing. Uh, and that want to be part of the change and transformation here in Norfolk. Um, so that outreach to the folks was to bring, hey, we've got these opportunities. 
We're going to make it available. We're going to put out a request for qualifications that did go on the street on, on March 28th. A big shout out to procurement on, on getting that one out. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, those responses will be due back May 23rd. Um, but we're looking for partners. And so there was a lot of positive energy from the forum. A lot of folks uh, uh, want to be or are, are going to apply and want to be part of this. They are uh, quite excited uh, about that. Um, from here, actually, I want to I want to turn it over to to my commissioners from the development uh, subcommittee. Um, again, uh, critical parts of of the event. I'll start with Mr. Fraley. Do you have any comments that you want to put as part of the uh, the forum? Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, I would just like to echo what Steve said initially. Uh, I think staff did a fantastic job in pulling this together. I, uh, I don't want to embarrass myself when I say how surprised, I guess, I was uh, at the number of folks who turned out. Uh, at the reception we had over at the Waterside, we had great attendance there, I thought. Uh, but the next day uh, at the Croc Center, it was literally a standing room only audience. Uh, we had green support from city council, uh, as well as city staff, the city manager was there. And uh, whenever the mayor, the city manager, or council people show up, you've gotten their attention. Uh, and, and I think that was the important thing, and I think it's critical that uh, under Nathan's leadership and staff support, that we send an early message to the city that uh, we're about uh, meaning serious business and trying to attract and move forward with a lot of the initiatives that we've uh, articulated previously. Uh, we have a lot of land. I, I was on the planning commission for 17 years, and I can tell you there wasn't even a meeting that went by that we didn't talk about vacant lots in the city. Uh, and Nathan come in and in such a short period of time, galvanized a lot of the uh, stakeholders from municipal government uh, that going to have to be involved in this. I think it's a yeoman's accomplishment to get that type of turnout and that type of support. Uh, and which is more, uh, we have not allowed the flame or the ember to burn out. We've gone out with an RFQ. Uh, I thought that was very, very timely in getting that out as quickly as possible, following up on the enthusiasm that seems that we garnered uh, uh, at the forum itself. And hopefully we'll get some, well, that's going to be the proof of the pudding. Hopefully we'll get some significant returns on that in terms of those who are looking forward to seriously partnering with us. Um, but from my perspective, I thought that we uh, really uh, lit the dynamite, if you will, in terms of <laughs> creating some excitement around what our potentials are in this city and how willing we are to partner with those in the construction and contracting and architectural communities uh, to come partner with us to make this, to put the meat on the bones of all the ideas that we're describing. But uh, I, I was enormously proud to be a part of it. And uh, I'm uh, equally anxious to see uh, what the overall outcome is in terms of participation when uh, participating in our RFQ. But there yeah. Always hard to come after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always. Um, but kind of to, to add to uh, what Commissioner Fraser was stating, I was very impressed with the engagement, the turnout, the staffs, um, how staff coordinated. Staff coordination was amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that I got an opportunity to do is go around and shake some hands and just talk to some people, whether they were developers, contractors, the city. And um, if you just look at, you know, the overall engagement uh, of the people and, and, and the look in people's eyes, you know, and the sincerity around what we were doing, I think one of the, one of the more uh, poignant comments that I heard from a developer was, um, I can't believe how transparent the housing authority is with all the stuff that they have. They're like, uh, <laughs> they're like, this is like, this is like never. They've never seen anything like this. Like, you know, a lot of these deals are backdoor. You know, family, friend, whatever the case may be. You know, they're used to it being. You have to be connected to get these opportunities. And for us to just put it on a platter and say, hey, this is for everyone. This is an opportunity for all of us to come together and not only create some excitement. But I think we created a, a sense of competition, right? Like, hey, you're not the only, you're not the only developer in town. There's there's opportunities. We have some great people come from within the region, 
this is a regional thing that we talked about. And I think that was in our mission statement as well uh, as a part of this. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking for regional talent, right? And I think we brought out some of the region's best talent um, in mind. You know, I got to speak with a lot of people who are doing a lot of good things within the region. And it was just refreshing to see. Um, I, I really kind of the second what you said, uh, Commissioner Fred, I really want us to take this thing and, uh, and run with it. You know, and get to what's next, right? You know, I know we talked about earlier uh, putting together a, a plan of action on how we're going to chronologically uh, attack some of these sites and things of that nature. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting there and get things done. So, great work to the team. Um, you know, I'm definitely excited. Echo a little bit. So, we had developers from Chicago, New York, Washington, Atlanta, as well as the region. So, there were folks that thought. That this was important enough to come well out from out of town. Um, so we were, we were really happy about that. I think another thing to accent is when you looked at that room, some of the comments I also had was people were impressed with it was truly a cross section of folks in that room. Um, and that was intentional, uh, but it also shows where the, our industry had, has gone and is going um, and the folks that are in there that are going to make a difference you know, throughout, not just here, but in, in other parts of the country is that there is a, it is a wide focus now. Um, and it's not just, as, as Terry on said, it's not just folks in the back room and friends of friends. It's, it's, it's a wide group, very talented group, a lot of great ideas, a lot of great work in other areas of the country. And we'd love to bring that here in, in, into Norfolk. Um, another item I just want to say is this sort of a follow-up. So we've got the RFQ out. Uh, working on the game plan on moving properties forward. We do have some uh, consultants we're working with on, on an evaluation of a lot of our properties and opportunities now to begin to tee those up also. But another part of what we're looking with the forum is um, we have our developers, but then there's another issue with um, local um, uh, contractors and vendors about doing business with NRHA. So that's going to be another focus coming up in, in the coming months. Um, we will, are working on an, uh, another RFP, and this is for, for vendors and for, for general contractors, um, across really the NRHA portfolio. So having a, a, a bank of folks, if, if our maintenance folks need it in public housing, if our uh, professional staff here are getting a, a, a lot ready, or we're looking to, or in partnership with one of our developers, if they're looking for contractors and builders, et cetera, we want to have a bank of folks that we can uh, put out there and saying, yes, these are these are pre-qualified folks. We know we we we've already you know gone through the process with them, and, and they'll be here in that list. And we will have that, and we'll make that available to other folks in the community. Um, as part of that, there will be training sessions. Uh, big thing. Um, we're we're a bureaucracy. The city's a big bureaucracy. Um, we have a lot of rules and regulations, and those can be difficult for our vendors and contractors to sort of navigate through. So as part of the work of not just, not just putting out the RFP, we'll have some training sessions on doing business with NRHA, bonding, you know, access to camp capital and things of that nature, and sort of pulling in some, some banking partners and other folks. Um, we're going to, again, as, as uh, Nathan had said at the forum, what we're looking to do is build a very strong ecosystem, uh, um, ecosystem in order to essentially deal with the affordable housing and the housing needs of our community. Um, so we're going to continue on that work and see that as part of our mission to sort of building all that up. Um, with that, that's uh, my report from the day. Any question, uh, questions uh, regarding the board report? Um, I do have, just to call out, I do have a, 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 a portion in the board report about the lease up on Aspire, I mean, on, on a reunion and origin. So if you want to see the numbers on how many folks have leased, how many people have moved in, how many folks of those are Tidewater family? It's in your board report. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, that was doing development committee, wasn't it? Yeah. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am Julie Norman, and I'm going to give you a quick update of what's happening and Client services. Uh, Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Rose Arrington has left. I wanted to also say to her, thank you for all the services she has provided. She has always been supported in anything dealing with a, a, a community engagement area, uh, especially in, in, in Digstown when she was a TMC president in Digstown. 
and becoming a commissioner. That was always excellent. And thank you to Scott, who's leaving to go to this beautiful site. <laughs> and uh, where is that area? Tampa. <laughs> Uh, thank him. Uh, and then I will go here. No, I, I have to say this. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nathan Sims, and to the board. Uh, since when we're talking about the programs, uh, especially that in community engagement and uh, client services, we can't do it without your support, and we can't do it without uh, collaboration and partnership. I was told a couple of weeks ago um, by someone, I don't know if I'm going to sound like this guy or not, uh, the guy said to me, hey, uh, Doc, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to get out of the, want to get out of the minor leagues and come get in the major leagues. Uh, you know, we got to step it up. We got to step it up. Did I sound like anybody? <laughs> so that was, that was Commissioner Albert. I have to say this. Um, I have to say this. I, I'm on the, um, I am literally on the, um, Economic, no diversity, economic um, equity and inclusion committee. And sometimes I'll say things, and I'll, and I'll apologize. Sometimes I'll say things, and I'll, uh, I'll write something that I know is not the direction he wanted to go into, and I'll put it up there intentionally because he gives me a history lesson every time. <laughs> the reason I do that sometimes is because I don't want to always be the person to keep saying why. Why, why? So when, when, we're, when we're doing things, he found a lot of times I'll say why. And it's because I need to know the history of stuff because when I see it, I can kind of build it into what we're doing. So sometimes I learn now how to write something off or leave something off and he'll give me the history <laughs> behind it. So the other day I apologized to him. He said, no, it's all right. It's nice that you get that. Hold on, says, No, doctor, it's all right. It's nice that you get the history behind it. So as, as we continue on in the client services area, I want to say you guys have an update of actually what we're working on, but one of the things I want to say is that through the committees and through the help of what you do as commissioners, um, thank you for my education and thank you for allowing my fire to continue to burn because it's almost like me sitting in a room and you pull the blinds open, open and now I see it from a different perspective. Uh, so that's, that's what you do. Uh, Commissioner Albert Lewis being on that board and I'm, I'm uh, yeah, this is education. So sometimes I'm like, do I need to have to go in a meeting because you guys know so much? And the reason I say that is because as I say, you guys know so much, it helps us in terms of what we're doing with our community engagement. So I gave you an update. I'm going to say this again. I gave you an update uh, in your packages, but I'm going to start it a little different by saying that I still have a minute and a half left, Scott. I'll start off by <laughs> piggybacking off of what Ms. Thompson said. Ms. Thompson talked about her surveys and she talked about the surveys and what she collected data and it went from uh, community engagement activities to what our residents wanted and different things like that. And you actually mentioned, hey, I passed that on to uh, client services. And we understand in client services, we are just servants and we are actually here to provide the supported services for our residents to engage in different activities for their upward mobility. So in, in response to that, we've created what we call the core teams. And the core teams have always been in our, our communities, but these core teams allow our residents to help be empowered to provide their input and in things that are going on, and we can listen to them directly. But most important, when we talk about those core teams, we have partners that sit at the table at the core teams to be able to help us in providing the services that our clients are actually saying that they want. Uh, so thank you for allowing us to have the information so that we can respond more effectively to our clients by providing the partnerships that we need to be in response to help make sure that they have the opportunity to not only grow, but engage in something that they say they want. Uh, I want to actually talk about, too, the uh, food desert transportation. We put out uh, an, an RFP recently for those who are living in Young, Calvert, and, and Hunter Square. Uh, we know that they face food insecurities in terms of the ability to go to grocery stores. So we put out an RFP to provide transportation for them to go to uh, the food, no, I'm sorry, to Walmart. And the reason Walmart was chose, 
out of those three communities, we received 451 surveys that talked to us about what grocery stores or how often they would shop. If we had transportation, would you go? What, what, what areas, uh, what, what time of the day would you like to go? How many times a week? So in response to that, we put out an RFP and uh, hopefully we will have that in place by May the 7th, I'm sorry, May the 2nd. And that will provide transportation for residents on Tuesdays and Saturdays to go to the grocery store in these three communities. And that will provide us an opportunity that these residents can have the response again by what they said to us from the surveys that they needed to go shopping. And that would be, uh, I would say, not only instrumental in terms of their empowerment to say that we are listening to them, but it's also an opportunity where we can show our residents that we do really care. So that pro program is underway. And also in your, in your package, you saw something about the uh, trauma critical incident uh, piece that we're setting up what we call a 23 hour, um, I guess that would be like a 23 hour stabilization program. And a 23 hour stabilization program would allow uh, uh, mental health professionals to actually work with clients right there on the spot for 23 hours to, to give them assessments and provide the services that they need within that time. Uh, gave you an overview of the core team, but also the grand opening for the Boys and Girls Club. The, the Boys and Girls Club in Dickstown had actually been closed now for over a year and a half, two years or so. And now we're looking at having them back online and we're looking at having a grand opening for them uh, sometime in May. And we're hoping that this is going to happen. We're just waiting for the final fire inspection. And at that point, uh, those core teams out in the Dickstown area and Oakley uh, actually planning a huge grand opening. We're looking at different services that we have available to them. And on a feel-good note, uh, the last piece that you received in your packet was something called uh, a perfect picture. Uh, the perfect picture was something that would come up what we call behind the lens. An old board member, uh, uh, Mr. Mustachio, uh, had a friend who donated uh, three uh, digital and 35 millimeter cameras uh, for for personal reason per se. However, uh, kids had an opportunity to meet with him, uh, that gentleman, last week. And we're creating a, pr a program called the P Perfect Picture. So this gives the young people an opportunity to use these digital cameras and take pictures of the communities in which they live. Uh, whether it is what they see is positive or negative, but it gives them, it's more of a therapeutic piece and it gives them an opportunity with those particular pictures that they can create a collage. Uh, why do we want that? Because that's therapy for the young people, but also it's engaging our young people also, also through our intergenerational programs that people are picking up and, and wanting to be a part of that now. It creates that collaboration. It creates that unity piece that they're working better together. And uh, they wanted to actually host their own opportunity where they can talk to other young people about what they see in the community, and they're doing it through uh, photography. And uh, that's all that I have. I have um, yes, sir. Um, is, is the food that the transportation is that in conjunction with New Beam Majority kind of like presented to us last year? But this one right here, specifically with Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, New Virginia Majority are familiar with the program, and they also. Uh, was interested in looking and, and supporting us and soliciting, soliciting the survey inf information. But uh, through the projects of uh, our executive director and our deputy, uh, this is right. This is actually through through us, and uh, we think is we, we know it's great because of the, uh, the participation. And uh, when you talked about the New Virginia majority, they were instrumental in saying, "Hey, that was a great idea. They like how we were doing." So okay. And last question I had, um, are we going to have, and this might be a question for the EP as well, but are we going to have a level of um, marketing or what, for the big time reopening? That's a long time for us to be closed. So I know we're going to have a, a brand opening. Are you know, we going to have news or some type of social media coverage that shows people? Because I know we've had some negative feedback, you know, from how long it's been closed or some mis misinformation. So our goal is to get information back on the right track. So are we going to have a level of advertising, marketing, and things associated? Commit, 
Commissioner Conyers, because I was limited to only three minutes, okay. <laughs> I could have spoke very extensively about that. However, we are on yesterday. Uh, we had a, a core team meeting, and at that core team meeting, there were uh, the in, in the community there were the churches, the, the school system. Uh, we had uh, Norfolk Police Department. We had mental health professionals. Uh, we had uh, City of Norfolk Library, uh, uh, Workforce Development, Civic League folks. Uh, who else did we have? So we had a mix of people at this uh, core team meeting, and that's what they're planning, the, the grand opening. Uh, at this point, the reason I couldn't give you a, a actual date is because we just know, don't know the date yet once that fire inspection is completed. But they are planning the activities as we speak. And those uh, partners who are there will have an opportunity to talk about the different uh, services that they provide, uh, the food bank. Uh, so it, that whole core team concept provides the opportunity that we will have the partnerships that we need to respond to the different things that our, our residents that they're looking to have in the community and, and actually help them to meet the goals that they set for themselves. And so we're providing supportive services. And we cannot, once again, we can't do it by ourselves and we need those partners. Yes, if I just will very quickly as, as a Christian friends and, and and perhaps add on to it and say uh, everything that you're saying here sounds amazing and it is the, the messaging that we want to get out. So I would echo that and push the fact that everything that, that you just talked about that happened, all those folks that are involved, everything that's going to be happening, I do think it's something that should be pushed out on social media because mm -hmm. that's that's the way everybody gets their information these days and and this is something that we, when we're talking about messaging, we talk about accurate messaging, talk about good messaging. I think that's a great and easy way to get that pushed out to the community. So I would just echo what you said and then really push the, the social media aspect of it. And, and it's being done. And as I said, we, we met on yesterday and there's a specific uh, a subcommittee that actually works on that and brings those ideas yeah. to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Very yes, much. Yes, sir. yes, sir. I, I just want to tell you, you need to be embarrassed or imitate them on the term with following. Oh, I did a good job. Oh, yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> I, I, did Thank you. I, I did have a question, though. Yes. Uh, you know, it seems that we've been talking about this food Texas issue since what we did for the memo. <laughs> and, and, and I recognize that uh, grocery stores usually make their decisions after they see bedrooms in place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've had Ty Water Young's Calvert, uh, they've been in existence. Uh, and, and we've yet to even, uh, shall I say, attract uh, a meaningful uh, conveyor of, of groceries uh, for those people. And we're coming back now with with uh, three new communities. He said, uh, are there any ongoing efforts? Uh, I know we're not likely to, to hook a, a food for the purveyor uh, overnight, but are there any ongoing efforts with us in the city and others? and may uh, be involved in, in attracting some, uh, to at least start enticing some of our food vendors to consider some of the locations. I'm just sitting here hearing you saying that, and as I draw my imaginary circle around where we are, uh, nearest grocery store is 21st Street. Uh, that's what, at least a mile away from, or over a mile away from all of those. So, and I don't know if this is the question for you, Julia, if not for the board or the ED, and, and, and uh, city economic development. But I feel like we need to have an ongoing dialogue with uh, providers of food services. I'm talking about the traditional grocery stores uh, to at least start now considering what we anticipate taking place over the course of the next three to five to seven years in hopes that we might be able to hook someone in here meaningfully that would be able to service uh, the residents of what's going to evolve from the St. Paul's block. Before Executive Director Nathan Sims answers that question, <laughs> I want to <laughs> sit at that table. Uh, but I, I want to say this, you're exactly right. Uh, when you talk about the proximity of what the stores were, the, the, those were questions that was answered on the surveys. So, so when we look at the, the, the number of surveys that we received back, when we listen to the statement that you had, when we listen to the areas where we know that uh, the food food insecurities exist and it is in the area where there's food deserts. There should be dialogues, uh, when, especially when we're talking about uh, creating healthier and safe and safer neighborhoods. We know that healthier and safer neighborhoods are people who are actually 
eating well. We know that safer communities are, are actually when people are performing. Sick people don't work. So we know really when we got people healthy, we create healthier communities because we have those different things in our community. So I'll be referring that to the table that you may sit. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I would say that there there have been different discussions, I think, in different pockets. I think where we're moving now is more of a joint discussion um, because, uh, you know, a lot of this is based off incomes and rooftops. And so um, that formula, you know, doesn't really change. And there's obviously a thin margin. But we, we, we are focused on bringing roots, you know, we have rooftops and we're obviously looking to redevelop our housing and add additional rooftops. And so that's starting to become part of the conversation. Uh, and we'll see where we can go. I mean, I even had a conversation last night um, that, hey, you know, let's, they have resources to, to kind of perhaps entice someone to come. Um, you know, we have rooftops. We can talk to the economic development in terms of their plans as well. So I think it's about, you know, the theme of this is probably like overall collaboration and saying, what are we doing to go uh, be able to get uh, the next grocer? I have a mm -hmm. comment on that just sure. real quickly. And uh, just, I think it's a discussion for another time, certainly not today, but I do want to kind of put my stake in the ground on it sure. because I think it's important. I've done some pretty extensive research on uh, uh, food desert, and I think that there's a lot of solutions potentially out there, but things that states have done in some localities that I believe the most successful usually revolve around tax credit yep. and, and rent reduction. Yep. And obviously that's something, like you said, that's going to have to be done in collaboration with others in the area. But I, I, I strongly believe that it is a huge issue. I think, as you mentioned, it, getting rid of them to the extent possible or mitigating is, is, is something that across the board affects communities in a multitude of positive ways. And I, I would recommend that there would be at some point maybe a, a not an official committee, but a, a group that, that gets together and discusses actually how to advance the ball on that quickly. Because I really do think that it's something that, that it's a problem that is extensive, but it's a solvable problem. And that's what the, that's what I like the best. I like problems that are solvable. <laughs> Same here. Um, and, 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 and then there, there is a lot of there's a lot of good data out there about that. So um, um, I, I would just like to say, yeah, discussion there another time. Sure. But I think we should put a stake in the ground and, and I, set a goal to, to do something about it because it's doable. I, I think it's a strategic collaborative initiative. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, if, if you're right, it's a complicated but solvable problem. I'm mm -hmm. not aware, and there could be, and not aware of them. Of, of any really successful um, grocery store in in a disadvantaged area, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't operate without the significant ongoing subsidy. Right. So yeah, but I mean, know, grocery store margins are so right, low so right, already. Right. They need to have get a grocery store. Then you have to keep yes. the grocery right. store. Right. Yeah. And so okay. that's not housing authority. It's not just the city. It's 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 so housing authority. The city. Your hospital, yeah. you know, the, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's sure. it ought to be, in my mind, a committed, focused, strategic initiative. But it benefits every single one of those groups as right well if it's solved. It yeah. Is, yeah. You know, because none, none of those entities, despite resources and, and good intentions, hopefully can do that on their own. Agreed. You know, we can we can maybe attract a great for here, but then we got to be able to make sure that they stay open. You have sufficiently provoked a very interesting Norman and Boyle. just wanna leave you with a little nugget. Yes. That it is said uh, the speed and direction of a ship is not determined by uh, the direction of the ship or the motor, but it's determined by the setting of the sail. And so that means how do you position yourself for the obvious discrepancies and things that impact this community? There's a lot of areas that meet food desert uh, definition, mm -hmm. but the people are able to overcome it because yeah. they have vehicles, they have access to other kinds of uh, uh, food, 
they experience food in a different way, so uh, it impacts an area differently. Having a food desert in a community that's extremely poor means that you're going to get a bad quality of uh, food. Kids with a lot of McDonald's right. and uh, things like that. So right. Thank you for uh, your provocative. You're welcome. And <laughs> as I complete my piece, I want you to know <laughs> we're going to be able to actually Mr. take 90 people. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Norman. Yes, you sir. You mentioned earlier um, some surveys. I Maybe I got the number four. Did you say 461 surveys? Uh, four, I believe it was 451. We, four. we, yeah, we surveyed Young's, Calvert, and Hunter Square. And from those surveys, um, we calculated the, the information, the data that you received. The data would have been that information that we were trying to solicit. Uh, how often do you go to the grocery store? So we did the average based on the input we got. What grocery stores would you attend? So would you go to? And we were looking mainly at the grocery stores that were on uh, areas within like three and a half miles of those larger grocery stores. So some of the grocery stores that were listed on the survey was grocery stores as far as the Walmart on Tidewater Drive uh, and also on Princess Anne Road, the Walmart, the food line, uh, the grocery stores that were in the Ghent area. Uh, so those grocery stores were the ones that were in the proximity that was on, on the survey. How many times a week uh, was up there? How many times a week do you actually shop? Another question on the, uh, on the survey included how many kids are in your household? How many family members do you, do you have in your household? Thank you. Could you get me a copy? I'll yes, sir. I can get that, that for survey. you. And it's available right now, and I can have it for you. Thank you. And a quick follow-up, and I'm finished. Um, the the Grandy, not Grandy Village, the Young Terrace food distribution that you used to have there. Beautiful. The bank, I know it's a, a help by the food bank. When will that reopen? When next Thursday. Next Thursday. Next Thursday. They they're they're stocking as we well for those who don't know the uh, the. Food bank had been closed a little while from uh, the Christmas holidays. We made some uh, modifications in terms of uh, getting the area clean uh, and also some updating some some things in in, in the uh, food bank. Uh, working with them, they're scheduled to open back up on next Thursday. I'm sorry, is that the food bank? Oh yes, yeah. so we had. So I noticed you know, my, what is it? The first baskets have to be. Food. First Baptist has one. Uh, St. Mary's, uh, they, they have one. We have a, a distribution center set up just like a grocery store that's available on Thursdays. And Thursdays, you can go there from uh, 9 o'clock to 12. It's actually set up for those who live in the St. Paul's area. Uh, so uh, along with the transportation that we're providing uh, to the grocery stores, in which we have able to actually uh, service 90 people a week. Uh, to be able to go to that grocery store. Uh, the food bank is also going to be open and provide services there as well. Mr. Norman, one last thing. You, you good? Oh, I just want to say, I said in the last meeting that when that food uh, distribution, food bank open, at some point I'd like for the commissioner's uh, board maybe to meet, have one of our meetings in the community and maybe tour, uh, maybe take a tour of uh, of young terrorists because we were talking about marketing and messaging and there's a lot of plus things that's going on there and I uh, like to follow up and kind of keep that front of mind. And, and as you say that Commissioner Lewis, uh, in in that young pop, young terrace, and I'm sorry for the I said young park because I grew up in that area, <laughs> but in that young terrace uh, service area, that service center, we have uh, Boys and Girls Club, mm -hmm. who celebrated their first one-year anniversary on yesterday. Um, their, their celebration was on yesterday. And uh, we also have a community health center in that facility, along with the food bank, and we also have Crestar Mental Health Service providers in there. So that multi-service center has a lot of activities that actually take place in there. Yeah, I want the commission's the yes, so I can set that up at any time. Okay.
Yes, sir. Last yes. Thing. yes, sir. Um, just okay, let, 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 me, let me just say, man, no, I mean, I'm sorry, Sarah. We're going to hear it, but let's make this the last, yeah. last. It is the last. Right. Yeah, just um, <laughs> when you guys are doing that, uh, <laughs> all right, so when you guys right, are doing that, that's the last thing you got. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, when you guys are, are, are doing the traveling with the, um, with the ferrying people over to the, um, because of the Walmarts, just yeah. be in coordination with the stores as well, too, because whether you have TANF or whatever, it's going to impact quantities, right? And it could be it could be an un unforeseen influx and uh, purchases at the store. You don't want people going to these stores. They don't have what you all need, so I would be part of stocking. Stock, yeah. And, and, stock, yeah. and, and in addition to that, absolutely. In addition to that, what you're saying, you're exactly right. We're also working, uh, our next level is working with the stores to make sure that there's particular sales. So we're flexible in, if we have to change the day of the week that we go so that we have opportunities where they can use coupons or going on days where there are great sales and things like that. So, yes. All right. Thanks so much. My role here is, is honored. Because I always have the two fastest committee reports. So we I have no committee reports and for safety and community engagement and for HCB, we are working as a committee to align our efforts to some of the enhanced changes that Nathan previously outlined. Thank you. Adam, what, what committee were you assigned to? Okay, that's what I was thinking. Okay, uh, and now uh, is that the last committee uh, update? Oh, awesome. <laughs> we get to go to the commissioner's comments. Who's been commenting all along? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm good. Uh, we're all we're all yeah, done. Uh, meeting. Maybe you told me this was going to be a quick meeting. <laughs> we're now 30 minutes past the average. I, I can only be responsible for the the authority personnel. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right. Uh, any commissioner comments? None. Can we entertain a motion to uh, bring this effort to a close? We don't need a motion. We're adjourned. We don't need a motion. You can adjourn. Oh, we don't need a motion. We do not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.